Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good evening. Good evening. Large and dead. Let me try again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good evening. Good evening. My name is Diane Abbott. I'm a Labour Party Member of Parliament and have been for 26 years. But I'm going to spare you a part of political speech because I believe you're intelligent enough to go away and read up about all the parties and make up your mind. I'm going to just say this. It's great to see you all bright and bushy-tailed as young students. And it brings me back to when I was a young student. Now, I graduated from university oh, at the end of the 70s, almost 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. And in many ways, I had to deal with a type of very crude racism that you don't have to deal with today. I remember going to see uh, one of my teachers and saying I wanted to do the Oxford and Cambridge entrance because 40 years ago, to go to Oxford and Cambridge, I'd take a completely separate examination. You couldn't do it on the basis of your A-level research. I'd take a separate examination, the Oxford and Cambridge entrance. And you also, if you wanted to do an art subject, by which they meant history, English, anything that wasn't a science, mm -hmm. You had to do Latin. Well, that completely eliminated a lot of state school children who'd never done Latin. Even I, when I sought to do Oxford Cambridge entrance, hadn't done Latin for two years. So I remember saying to my teacher, my history teacher, that I wanted to do the Oxford Cambridge entrance. And she looked at me and she said, I don't think you're up to it. Now, I don't think people say that kind of thing nowadays, but she said it to me and didn't feel no way. But fortunately, my quite assertive, Jamaican heritage kicked in, and I said, but I think I'm up to it, and that's what matters, isn't it? And she couldn't, so she had to tutor me. There was one sort of white girl and me that she tutored for an extra term after we'd finished sixth form to do the Oxford and Cambridge entrance. And the white, I mean, she really loved the white girl. She loved her, she loved her, she loved her. And she, she only taught me, as it were, under duress. But I think the world has heard, <laughs> the world has heard a little bit more about me than about Penny, the girl she loved. So hey, you know, everything works out. So look, so I had to deal with a lot more overt racism um, than I think is around today. But you know, some things were better. One of the things that were better was that my education was completely free from start to finish. There were no tuition fees, I got a maintenance grant. And actually, it was very easy to pick up jobs in your holidays. If you couldn't get a job, you could, you could sign on. The second thing that was better was that within a decade of leaving university, I'd bought my first flat. Now, you will all, there'll be a sharp intake of breath when I tell you what it cost to buy a flat in London in the 80s. My first flat cost me £21,000. And none of you, and none of you, I think, unless you've got very rich parents, will be able to buy a flat in London within 10 years, within 20 years, actually. The other thing that was different was actually, um, there was racism and so on, but you ca I came down from Cambridge with my degree, and I really felt the world was my oyster. And I really felt there was a whole range of jobs available to me. And I felt not, could I get a job, but what job did I want? And if you didn't like a job, you could leave it on Friday and get one on Monday. So the world that I graduated into, although there were some things that were not so nice and we hadn't made the progress we have today, as a young undergraduate, didn't have the debt, buying a home was perfectly within reach, and getting a decent job was perfectly within reach. And I think that young people graduating today face a very grim prospect. There's the debt. Now you've heard about tuition fees. Let me tell you that I am opposed to tuition fees full stop. I voted against the Mandra Labour government, got into a lot of trouble about it, and I voted against them under the Tories. Because, precisely because I had a free education, why should I pull up the ladder for young people coming forward? And also, I know. I mean, my father, one of these West Indian fathers, is pretty strict. And if I had said to him, oh, Daddy, I want to go to university, and by the way, I'm going to come down with £40,000 worth of debt, he'd say, go and be a nurse like your mother. He would have said that. He wouldn't have. Why should people that worked so hard and saved and struggled say, yeah, yeah, have £42,000 worth of debt? So it would have been an impediment for me, coming from a family where both my parents left school at 14. Some of you, I'm sure, have quite brown families. But my family were working class West Indians who both, both my mother and father left school at 14. The debt would have been an impediment for me, so I've never been prepared to vote for it. So I think there's the debt. 
I think there's the housing thing. Nobody on an average, even a good white collar wage, can afford to buy in London. And I think that's probably true of cities like Manchester and Birmingham now. And that's extraordinary. And then, of course, the, the, the job situation. Too many people are coming down from university, having done everything they're supposed to do, and worked extremely hard, and yet it is such a struggle to get a job. I work, as some of you know, um, I used to do a programme on a Thursday night called This Week. I used to do it with a man called Andrew Neal, who's a Tory. But Andrew Neal said to me a few years ago, he said to me, you know what? He said, the world of work, like the media and law and politics and so on, he said, you know what? It's more about who you know than it's ever been. And he said, if you and I, because Andrew Neal, some of you may not know him, but he's, he's a very important uh, journalist now. But he went to a grammar school in, in Glasgow and comes from a, a lower middle class family. So if you and I were starting out now, we couldn't get where we've got. He said, it's all about who you know. Because what's true about Andrew Neal, what's true about me, I stepped out into the world where I knew nobody. My parents knew nobody except for other people that worked at the hospital and other people that worked at my dad's factory. Mm -hmm. So I think that young people graduates, whatever their colour, but more so if they're people of colour, face quite difficult prospects. So faced with those difficult prospects, you're going to say to me, well, why should we bother about politics? These politicians, they're all the same. It doesn't make any difference how you vote. Or, to use one of those great slogans, if voting made a difference, they'd ban it. OK, good. That's a very common attitude. You don't like politicians. They're all on the fiddle with their expenses. Voting doesn't make a difference. They're all the same. But stop. Stop. We've had a coalition government the first thing they did was do away with education maintenance allowance. They've made cuts after cuts after cuts, which are going to affect your prospects of getting a job when you graduate. Because don't think, just because they're public sector cuts, or you don't want to work in the public sector, you don't have business, nothing to do with you, public sector cuts, nothing to do with you. Actually, public sector cuts have an effect on the private sector because a lot of private sector organisations depend on public sector contracts and public sector work in order to function. The cuts that have been made in legal aid, and true, you know, full disclosure, the legal aid cuts were started under the Labour government. The cuts that have been made in legal aid are making it very, very hard. A lot of BME high street solicitors I know have had to close down, make it very hard for people to have a career in law. So I think you face very grim prospects, and it's largely because of decisions made by politicians. You know, this coalition government didn't have to scrap the MA. They chose to do it. They didn't have to make big cuts in the public sector. They chose to do it. They didn't have to triple tuition fees. They chose to do it. And you're saying, hmm, so why do they choose to do things which are so contrary to my interests? Because they think you don't care. They think the only people that vote are middle-aged white people living in the Midlands. And they're the only people they need to worry about. Politics is like a computer game. What you put into it is what you get out of it. If they feel that people that look like you don't care don't ask hard questions, and above all, do not vote. They will do what they like to you. Look, if you look at the cuts they've made, you know one group? They're very, very, very scared of cutting. I'm not saying they should do it, but they're very, very scared of cutting old people. You know they don't want to cut old people's benefits? Because old people vote. The minute you go for old people's benefits, old people are going to be queuing up outside your office saying, what happened? What happened to my bus pass? What happened to my, my free fuel allowance? What happened? What happened? They will do it. Whereas it happens to us, and we say nothing. And if we meet a white politician, it's, oh, we're so glad to see you, instead of asking them some difficult questions. So what I say to you is, I mean, for instance, there's a debate going on now about air passenger duty. And those of you that are from the Caribbean will know that air passenger duty has been a huge blow to the Caribbean. Um, it's, it's put hundreds on the price of a ticket, and it's a completely arbitrary system, but we're having a debate on it, and the government is refusing to move on it because they're not hearing from the communities affected by air passenger duty. So, what I say to you is, it's easy to say, oh, politicians are boring, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any difference, and they're all the same, but so long as you say that, the political classes, whether they're the Labour political classes, or the Tory political classes, or the Lib Dem political classes, they can afford to ignore you. They can afford to ignore you and ignore your mum and dad, and do things day after day after day that put you and your communities under the cosh. And when some young people, young people that aren't as focused as you, young people that aren't in education, young people that are just on the margins, when they kick off, 
and uh, looting their writing, the same little classes say, oh dear, what's the matter with them? What is the matter with them? I mean, some of them may not, some of them may be bad boy and so forth, but what is really the matter with them is their community is under the cosh in the summer before the Tottenham riots, the council was forced because the government cuts to cut every single summer project. So I say to you this simple thing, that politics affects key things about your life. If you don't even bother to understand it, let alone vote, politicians will continue to ignore you. And until communities mobilise, until young people get involved, this one thing is for sure that nothing will change. I remember 2007, 2008, the run-up to US presidential elections. And nobody believed the black man could win. Nobody believed the black man could win. I didn't believe the black man could win. I saw the polls and I thought, you know what? These people are going to go in the polling station and they just will not vote for someone called Barack Obama. But you know, black people in America didn't say a black man can't win, nothing makes a difference, they're all the same. They queued in the hot sun for hours. People had never voted before. People voting in states in America which are bitterly racist and tried to put all sorts of opposition where they're voting. They queued in the hot sun for hours and they delivered something that none of us thought we would ever see. A black man with a Muslim name, the president of the United States, the leader of the free world. And to me, whatever has he's done or not done since then, that expression of what all the people can do when they make up their minds say, you know, I don't know quite what it's going to be like. I don't know whether this is the best thing, but I am going to queue from morning to night to deliver this change. And as about Barack Obama said when on his concession speech, I, re I remember because I was watching, I was in tears, and he said, change has come to America. Change can come to Britain if you guys get involved, get engaged, and at the very least vote. Thank you very much.